I'm Sebastian St. James. In two previous videos we discussed how when a stock goes ex-dividend the price drops precipitously. The question is, is there a way of profiting from that drop? In a previous video one of my viewers asked, good information in there SSJ, thanks. You're welcome Dave W. Would it be an opportunity to short if this is a regular occurrence? Dave W is asking, if a stock consistently drops when it goes ex-dividend, why don't I short it? Because when you short, you make money on the way down. We know the stock is going down, short it, and guaranteed profit, right? Well, let's break this down. How does buying a stock long, what does long mean? That's just the regular way of buying stocks, work, and then we'll figure out how short selling actually works. When you buy long on day one, you buy ABC for $10. Someday in the future, you sell it for $15. How much profit are you making? 15, the sell price minus the buy price, which is 10, equals $5 profit. So you make money when the stock price goes up. On the other hand, with short selling on day one, you sell ABC for $15. Yeah, it's backwards. In the future, you buy ABC for $10. Now, the profit is exactly the same. It's the same math. The sell price, which is $15, minus the buy price, which is $10, equals $5 profit. So, with short selling, you make money when the stock price falls. Short sellers make money when the stock price falls. The stock price falls when a stock goes ex-dividend. Guaranteed profit, right? Dave W says, if this is a regular occurrence, the questions that we have to ask is, do stock prices drop reliably when they go ex-dividend? And can I short them and profit? Let's answer the first part. Do stocks actually religiously fall when they go ex-dividend? Fortunately, I've done two videos on that already, so we can just tap into those examples. Adairs went ex-dividend on the 5th of September, and if we have a look at its stock price, it's going along quite nicely, and then, oh, yeah, definitely drops right there on ex-dividend date. How do I know that's exactly ex-dividend date? Well, it's the 5th of September and the D. See the big D there? Yeah, that's when it went ex-dividend. AFG, Australian Financial Group. Here is its graph going on quite nicely. Goes ex-dividend, that's the D, and then whoa, plummets to the ground. Nothing could be clearer other than that graph is saying, yeah, I now must fall. It is my duty. ASB on the 7th of September, zigzagging along in a narrow range, hits ex-dividend date and plummets, bang. Oh, and then we zigzag along again. Are these stocks that have gone ex-dividend that show the precipitous drop cherry-picked? No, they're not. The dates are cherry-picked because I looked up the stocks that had gone ex-dividend around a particular date. So that part is cherry-picked, but the actual stocks and what they're doing, no, it's literally as they happen. It is that reliable. AUB went ex-dividend on the 7th of September. It's going along, drops. Yes, it's got ex-dividend, of course it does. Brambles BXB on the 7th of September. Its share price, well, it is actually going down there, but yeah, it's definitely a distinctive drop on the ex-dividend date, notice the D. So, do stock prices drop reliably when they go ex-dividend? The answer is yes, absolutely they do. Now, can I short them and profit? To answer that, we need to find out how do I short stocks? Before I answer you that, I need to find out how do I long stocks? Because longing and shorting are awfully similar, except they're just reversed. So buying shares long, which is a regular way of buying them. Step one, find someone who's willing to sell me shares of ABC at the price I want. So how do I do that? Do I ask around? Do I ask a few neighbors? No, you go to the stock exchange, say I want ABC for $10, and then you simply put in your bid. If somebody wants to sell you for that price, you meet up, you have a happy marriage, and you exchange shares for money. It's quite simple. With short selling, you borrow shares of ABC at the price you want. Borrow? How do I borrow shares? I've never gone onto the ASX and borrowed some shares. It's always buy or sell. Never borrow. You firstly have to find a broker who will participate in short selling for you. Now, what you do is you go to the broker and say, I'd like some shares of ABC, thank you very much at this price, the broker says yes or no, but if the broker says yes, then you're on board with short selling. When you're buying shares long, you execute a buy trade. When you're short selling, you execute a sell trade. When you're going long, you let the market go up. When you're short selling, you let the market go down. Well, hopefully it does. When you're going long, you sell ABC shares and then you profit. When you're short selling, you buy ABC shares and profit and then you return the shares to the lender because remember you just borrowed them a few days earlier. Right, so buying long 
and short selling are almost the same, except the order's a bit mixed up, is that right? Yes, and there's a bit of borrowing that goes on. Can you give me a summary? Yes, I can. Short selling of shares. Number one, you borrow shares of ABC. Number two, you execute a sell trade. How can you sell them? Well, because you've borrowed them. So you've got the shares there, you can physically sell them. Well, electronically anyway. You let the market go down, you buy them back at a cheaper price and therefore profit. And when you've got them back in your hot little sweaty hands, you return them back to the lender. The lender may not even know that you borrowed them. Right, so let's look at Adair's ADH. On the 5th of September, they go ex-dividend, right? The graph demonstrates that there's definitely going to be a drop on that date. Let's short sell some ADH shares. So we borrow them on the 4th of September or any time before that. Sell them on September 4. Why September 4? Well, they're going ex-dividend on the very next day, September 5. So maybe September 4 is when they'll be at their peak. On September 5, as predicted, they go ex-dividend and you buy them back immediately. You don't have to, there's no law, but you may as well get it over and done with if you're following this strategy. You wait T plus two days. Why T plus two? Because it takes that long for the trade to settle, in which case you don't actually have the shares in your account until two days later. So on the 7th of September, the shares actually now have gone to you because you bought them back and you've waited your T plus two, and now you return them back and cover the borrowing. Right. Good, I'm ready to go. How do I actually execute this exactly? Step number one is to have a margin account with a broker. Sorry, a margin account? What in the world is one of those? Let's say I want to buy a thousand shares of ABC at $100 a share. That equals $100,000. Only problem is, I don't have $100,000. Oh, how embarrassment. What are you gonna do? Fear not, margin loans to the rescue. It's like buying a house. You put down a deposit, the bank pays the rest. When you're buying shares on margin, you put down a deposit and the bank, or in this case, the broker, pays the rest. So how much can I actually borrow? Here is the lending ratios of Westpac. I've chosen Westpac at random. A2M, which is A2 milk, you can have a LVR of 50%. AGL, I can have an LVR of 75%. So you can see different shares have a different LVR attached to them. LV what? What does that stand for? LVR is the loan to value ratio. So I need $100,000 to buy in 1,000 shares of ABC. The broker of notice offers me an LVR of 60% on ABC. Very nice of them. So therefore, I have to put in $40,000 of my own cash. The broker lends me the other 60,000. That's why the LVR is 60%. Excellent. Well, such a gift that the broker is giving me. No, you have to pay fees. So I have to pay the margin loan interest. At the moment, NAB's margin loan interest rates, and I've taken them as a random example, is 7.5%. Wow, oh, that's a bit expensive. 7.5%. Well, interest rates lately have gone up. Also, the cheapest way you can borrow money is to borrow for your house. Interest rates on margin loans are actually up a bit. They're not quite as high as credit cards, but they're definitely far more expensive than if you're borrowing for real estate. Plugging that back in, after I borrow my $60,000, I then go on to pay a 7.5% per annum interest rate. Good, so the broker has all these shares which they're willing to lend me, right? They must have a huge portfolio. No, typically they don't. They actually borrow from somebody else. When you borrow shares via your broker, you're typically borrowing from the broker's clients who have agreed for a fee to lend out their shares or possibly from ETFs or mutual funds or other brokerages who have agreed to lend out their shares. With some brokerages, if you own shares, they'll actually ask you, would you like to have the option of lending out shares for a certain fee, right? So you get that benefit. And you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm gonna be holding these shares for the next 10 or 20 years anyway. I may as well get a few fees along the way. So sure, lend out my shares if you want to. It's optional, you don't have to, but that is one place, the main place, where brokerages get their shares from to borrow out for short selling. Good, so I go to my current broker, get a margin loan account and start immediately short selling through them. Is that right? Well, no, depends where you are. In the US, yes, probably a lot simpler. In Australia, very few brokerages actually short sell. It's fairly rare. As a random example, Comsec, one of the largest brokerages in Australia, do they short sell? No, a Comsec share trading account only allows you to sell stock that you already own. So that's another hurdle, finding somebody through whom you can actually short sell. Of course, once you've borrowed the shares, then there are fees and there are risks. Risks? Uh, excuse me, we just talked about fees. 
Nobody mentioned anything about risks. What's that about? Well, if you're buying long, you buy ABC shares, a thousand of them at $10. That's $10,000. Now, what happens if ABC goes bust? The most you can lose is $10,000. Well, that makes sense. Stocks can't go below zero. They can't go into negative numbers. So if I put $10,000 in and it goes bust, the most I can lose is $10,000. On the other hand, if you're going to short sell, you borrow a thousand shares of ABC. Now you sell those for $10,000, the same as the first example. However, ABC goes up from $10 to $50. Whoa, something exciting is happening. Now, you've got to buy back those shares. Remember, you're short selling, you've got to cover your short. Therefore, you have to buy your thousand shares at $50 and that equals $50,000, but I only put $10,000 to start with. That's right. Therefore, you have a loss of $40,000. Oh. So when you're buying shares long, the most you can lose is your initial capital investment. But when you're short selling, you can actually lose far more than you put in in the first place. They can go up infinitely. Who knows how far they'll go up while you're holding them and you haven't covered your short. In our example, we put down $10,000, but our loss was $40,000. Sebastian, you have not yet talked me out of short selling because I know for a fact that when shares go ex-dividend, they drop. I'm not going to be subject to the risk you just mentioned, right? Well, that's possibly true, but there's a question yet to answer. What about the dividend itself? Sebastian owns 1,088 shares via broker Lucy Goosey. Oh, Lucy Goosey is my favorite brokerage. The most exciting thing about them is they actually do short selling. Dave W, that's the person who originally left the question and this entire video is based on his question. He borrows 1,088 shares from Sebastian via Lucy Goosey. Okay, this is interesting. So Dave H actually borrows from a real person. I mean, they're real shares. How does this work? Do I have to somehow send off an email to Sebastian and say, uh, I noticed that you've got with our shared broker, a thousand shares in ADH. Can I have them? No, it's far simpler than that. Sebastian agrees. Remember, he ticks the box to say, yeah, at any time you can just go ahead and lend out my shares. Now, Dave H talks to the broker and arranges with the broker, but has nothing to do with me directly. I may not even realize that my shares are being lent out, except when I get the fee at the end. So Dave sells his ADHD shares on September 4, prior to it going ex-dividend, to Dividends Forever on the ASX. Who is Dividends Forever? I haven't heard of him yet. Here's a random third party who's come in to buy the shares from Dave H. They've never met either. On September 5, ADH goes ex-dividend. We know that already. On September 6, ADH settles with Dividends Forever. Remember, it's T plus two. It was sold on the 4th. So at 5 p.m. on September the 6th, the dividend is actually awarded to Dividends Forever because he legally owns them. They've already settled by that date. Then, Sebastian demands his dividend. What? Why am I demanding a dividend all of a sudden? Well, remember, I actually own the shares originally. They're borrowed from me, but from my point of view, I still own them. I may not even realize they've been borrowed. Therefore, because my shares, which I still think I own, I don't really, have gone ex-dividend, that I need to be paid that dividend. Someone has to stump up the cash. So, who is it? Well, it's Dave. Dave has to pay the dividend amount to Sebastian. So why is Dave paying? Well, Dave borrowed Sebastian's shares. If they happen to go ex-dividend within the time he's borrowing them, then he has to stump up the dividend amount, the same amount exactly in cash, and give it to Sebastian via the broker. Essentially, this is what happens. Share ABC on day one is worth $14. The short seller borrows that amount and sells it at $14. Day two, it goes ex-dividend, therefore he sells it at $10 and makes a $4 profit. That we know already. But he takes that $4 profits, transfers that to the lender. So in other words, he hasn't made anything out of it. And the short seller also have to pay the borrowing costs on top of that. Oh, oh well, that's not very good. So short sellers don't benefit from shares going ex-dividend because they personally have to pay any dividend on shares which they're currently borrowing. There are three parties involved in this transaction. Four, if you want to include the brokerages. How do they actually view dividends from their own little bubble? Dividends forever. He loves dividends. He constantly buys stocks just for the dividends. Well, he buys ADH prior to it going ex-dividend, of course, because he wants a dividend. And he receives the dividend directly from ADH itself from the company. 
because on the record date, which is the day after ex-dividend date, he legally owns the shares. From Sebastian's point of view, he owns ADH. It's secretly been lent out to him. He may not even know, but he receives the dividend via the brokerage, plus he receives a lending fee. Good. Well, Sebastian's happy. Dave W, he borrows ADH via the broker. He makes a profit because the shares went ex-dividend. He pays that profit to the broker. In other words, he has no direct dealing with Sebastian at all. Plus, he pays fees and costs. So now we have all our answers. Do stock prices drop reliably when they go ex-dividend? The answer is yes. Can I short them and make a profit? No, because you have to pay the dividend to the party from whom you borrowed the shares. Well, that's disappointing, isn't it? The question remains, why are stocks actually precipitously dropping when they go ex-dividend? What's causing this? Is dividend forever? And all his mates who are there on forums saying, buy dividends, buy dividends. Do they jump in just before it goes ex-dividend? And when it goes ex-dividend, they jump out and take their money somewhere else? Well, maybe they do, I don't know. But there is actually a good reason why shares drop in price. And I've covered that in a previous video. Go ahead and watch it here now.